Welcome to A Walk in the Garden. I'm Liz Davey, and this program is filmed by NCTV, Norfolk Community Cable, in my garden here in Norfolk. Uh, we're filming today in mid-September, and it's uh, starting to feel a little bit by, like fall today. It's a beautiful fall day, early fall day. We've had so much rain throughout the summer, and that uh, continued into yesterday. But we've got a few nice days coming up, so it's time to get out and start doing some pre-preparation for fall. Today I'm going to tackle, start tackling a birdhouse. The birds have finished nesting for the season, so it's time to get those birdhouses cleaned out and either stowed away or at least left open so that uh, other creatures like mice and chipmunks, if they're low, don't take over. For this I'm going to wear a mask and gloves. There are certain uh, funguses and also viruses that birds carry that you don't want. And so we want to take the houses down. And then I used a screwdriver to loosen the screws. And this particular birdhouse has a spot that just tips open once you take one of the screws out. And then you can access the material that's inside. And I'll just put that into my, and a mouse just jumped out, as you probably saw. So they've already found it. We don't really want that. So I will carefully, because there are sometimes mice in them, you have to be careful how you get the things out. And we'll just tip this back and forth. But uh, you get the idea. We'll empty out the birdhouses. And the mice nest. There's another one. Good to get this one emptied. They can cause some damage to your birdhouses in the winter, so you want to make sure that they are emptied out. I was not aware of the presence of the mouse. Unfortunately, I'm not afraid of them, so I didn't jump. This birdhouse will be put away for the winter and brought out back out in the spring. At this point, I can take off my gloves and my mask. Again, always good to have it on when you're dealing with the birds and mice. Now I'm going to come up and do some harvesting. And today I want to make, again, we're talking about mice and other creatures that may get into places. And in my shed, garden shed, or if you have a garage where you store things, I'm going to make a couple bouquets of smelly herbs. These are herbs that uh, are not culinary herbs. They probably were medicinal herbs at one time. They may still be for those who practice herbalism. I do not. But I have some tansy and rue. and southern wood. And the southern wood really grew well this year. I was not able to prune it this spring. It will be pruned next spring. All of these herbs that I'm picking now are half hardy annuals. And they'll lose their leaves, but they get most of their leaves. But they get pruned down come spring, as does lavender. I don't prune that now. And I don't prune roses until spring. Other things like thyme and sage we'll be using right up until Thanksgiving or thereafter. But I'm bundling these herbs with a rubber band. And then I will hang them in my shed. And I'll make several bunches of these before the season's over to hang in the shed and hopefully repel some of the creatures that might want to find a home there this winter. Any of the uh, herbs that you have that you want to dig and bring in for the winter that are not hardy, like rosemary and bay, bay leaf is another one. You can be digging those now and putting them outside in their pot and then bringing them in as uh, bad weather threatens. These herbs will last. Rosemary will, and lavender both will stay green down to about 20 degrees. So you've got a little time for that, but it's good to get it 
started and get those herbs in before the heat comes on. And I'm picking some sage right now. And sage dries extremely well. I have several different varieties which I'm going to pick. It also is a perennial. It will come back next year. But again, I'll bundle this with a rubber band and I'll hang this inside to dry and then put it away. This is a little soiled, so when I take it in, I will wash it off and then make sure that it's good and dry. And hang it up and uh, let it dry and we'll have sage to use all winter. I'm going to use some sage today in the cooking portion of this program. Now let's head over and see what's blooming in the perennial garden. As I stand here in the perennial garden, I'm with some of the fall bloomers and we have a lovely monarch butterfly that's on one of the zinnias. I moved some of the zinnias from my vegetable garden. I planted them in the spring in the ground and when they came up they needed to be thin so I brought some of them out here and I'm very glad I did because they've been wonderful to add color to this perennial garden when some of the perennials are not blooming and they also have attracted some of the butterflies like the monarch. The monarchs are now busily fledging their last group of progeny that will fly off to the south and spend the winter. But not all butterflies and insects fly away for the winter. We may not see them, but many of them will stay either as cocoons or chrysalises in our gardens, which is why it is recommended not to cut down everything as we used to do. I used to clear the garden, cut everything back to the ground, and start again in the spring. Now I leave many of the perennials standing, and I leave some of the leaves so that these creatures have a place to go and spend the winter in a cozy little spot in the garden. I'm among the bees here today. This is a heartleaf aster. It has very pale blue blooms. And behind me is a plant called Boltonia. It is not an aster, but it is related, and it has white blooms now. In front of me, with the dark foliage, is a Eupatorium chocolate. It's a mouthful, but it will have some nice light white blooms to go with the dark foliage that we've had all summer. Again, uh, the annuals, as the flowers go by, I snip them back and uh, leave them and they will continue to bloom until we get a hard frost, which could be any time from about uh, October 8th is our average frost date in Norfolk. Now, average doesn't mean we're going to have a frost that day. It could come before that or it could come after that. And considering the crazy weather we have had this year, uh, there's no telling, but it's time to start thinking and being aware of the forecasts so that you aren't caught with uh, plants that need to come in very suddenly and no time to get them in. Uh, many of our plants will not stand a heavy frost or even a light frost. So you want to be aware and start moving them inside now. The grasses are also in bloom right now. I have grasses over here. And I've been cutting some of those to add to floral arrangements. Also the, the Waltonia and the asters. I'm going to come around this way. And I don't want to scare our butterfly friend. It doesn't seem to be very frightened of me today. It's more hungry. This is another aster that is covered with buds. It's a pink New England aster. And it's uh, a hybrid, which makes it a little shorter than some of the others I have. I'm still collecting seeds from my butterfly weed. It's still uh, putting out quite a few seeds. These will come up on their own if I don't collect them, and I won't get all of them, so I probably will have butterfly weed coming up here and there. But I am saving some of them to share with others who don't have this beautiful orange flowered plant. I'm letting the rose form rose hips. Uh, we don't have any blooms right now, but it is forming some rose hips. We have another butterfly here, that's a sulfur yellow one on the blue aster, and now it's down in the grass. But we've had a lot of butterflies lately on these late blooming plants, so it's 
it's nice to have something that blooms late. There he is. And lots of bees. The bees are love the sedum. This is sedum autumn joy. It has opened up. It needs to be divided next year, and all the rain that we've had have caused it to be about six inches taller than usual. Often I put a support around it, uh, something like this, and these supports, can, I can start taking these out and storing them for the winter, but I did not get one on that plant, and that's what happened. It uh, opened right up. It's still pretty, though, and these will turn a dark, 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 magenta, not really magenta, burgundy, burgundy color before they finally uh, dry into brown for the winter. I leave those in the garden. They're a nice plant for winter interest. They look great with snow on them. This is uh, another native aster, and again, it is covered with honeybees today. I don't have a beehive any longer, but someone nearby certainly must because there are honeybees all over it today, so somebody will be making some very nice honey. In the back I have a butterfly bush, which again has attracted many butterflies, and down here a uh, lemon verbena. This has gotten quite large, usually it stays quite low, and I'll be picking that and drying some of it for tea. It makes a lovely tea, and I also use it in some of my baked goods. It has a lovely lemon flavor and lovely lemon scent. More of the uh, transplanted zinnias. They really did get tall this year. Often they're two, or two, two and a half feet tall. These really stretched out. And again, I'll come out and until frost, I'll keep taking off the spent ones, like this one, and cutting them back and composting those pieces. And then the, the uh, branching at the sides will form new blooms. Chrysanthemums are now coming into bloom. And I may add a few to the garden later, uh, or within the next few weeks. But this is one that's been here for about 10 years. And I cover it in the winter with uh, oak leaves in a basket. And I cut it back in the spring, and off it goes. And then we cut it back to keep it somewhat shorter than it would be. It would be very tall and leggy if I did not pinch out the new growth in the spring. Coming down this way, the black-eyed Susans are pretty much gone. This is a peony that has been attacked by some mildew, and this will be cut back to the ground very shortly, any time. You can start cutting that back. Oh, by the way, I passed my, uh, in back I have a hummingbird feeder, and the hummingbirds generally leave in September. However, I have seen them flying today, so I'm going to leave my hummingbird feeder up a while until I see no more hummingbirds. But we may see one buzzing around today. They've been very active on the nice days, and they are still in the area. They have not left. They are one of the birds that do fly south, and they will disappear usually by October 1st. So we'll see if we're still seeing them or not and then we can take that hummingbird feeder down and stow it away for the winter. Another aster, this is another New England aster. This one is in a little more sun, so it has a little more bloom on it now. The others will come into bloom a little later. Right now, we're enjoying the fall garden and considering what we'll clean up and what we won't. None of the natives will be cut back, or at least, most of them will not be, unless they are covering something else. But uh, I will leave these up until spring and do my cutbacks later on. Any annuals can be removed once they've stopped flowering and we've had a frost. And I'll cut back any iris, uh, which is not a native plant, and it can be cut back. It uh, resents being wet and leaving the leaves on promotes wetness, so you want to get it cut back before winter. Now let's head on to the vegetable garden and see what's happening there. The vegetable garden is still going, but it is on its way out. Uh, I'm still able to pick some beans, believe it or not. These beans have been bearing for about two months, and as long as you keep beans picked, they will keep 
providing you with beans. So they're getting a little shabby looking, but we do get beans. I'm also getting some cucumbers, though again, the vines are starting to go. My tomatoes, I've got plenty of cherry tomatoes. Unfortunately, with all the rain, a lot of them have split, even though this is supposed to be a variety that doesn't split. It's just too much when the rain is so heavy. I have some of those in yellow pear tomatoes. However, my main season tomatoes are gone and they will be removed in the cages and stakes stored for the winter very soon, now that we're getting a few nice days. I can still pick arugula and beets and chard and some perpetual spinach and kale. And we're gonna use some kale today. Some of the best broccoli and kale is picked after we get a frost. So don't pull out your kale and broccoli. Save it after frost. Uh, you don't have as much insect damage. And you have some of the best broccoli of the season once it's cooler. It likes cool weather. Kale, I keep spraying it with a uh, spinosad spray, which uh, helps with the insects, those little white butterflies. Uh, like to lay their eggs on kale and broccoli, so we want to keep those away. And the kale again becomes sweeter once it's frosted, and the kale will last well into November, as will the broccoli. Uh, beans will go with the first frost. I also have some small cabbages. I've been picking those and using them. Some of the leaves are not the greatest, but once you take those outer leaves off, the cabbage is fine. Again, more zinnias. And I have some marigolds that are now blooming for fall color. We have pumpkin vines, and I have at least one pumpkin. Maybe not anymore. Uh, I planted them quite late. But I always, you never know, you may get a couple pumpkins, or at least one. So that's what's going on there. I have a few herbs I can still pick. Uh, a lot of basil, different kinds of basil, red basil, lemon basil, and just the regular basil, and there's some sage still hanging on too, and cilantro. So we're still getting use out of the garden, and we have carrots and beets that can be pulled. So the garden lasts long after Labor Day. It's not over just when fall comes. It is more likely to be over. Here we have another butterfly friend. <laughs> it's more likely to be over uh, once we get a killing frost. And again, you have to watch if you have things that are just starting to bear in the garden, you may wish to cover them up. If you've got a tomato that's still going, producing fruit, peppers, you may wish to cover them for the first frost or two with a blanket or sheet or landscape fabric. But once the hardest killing frosts come, the garden is pretty much finished for the season and it's time to clean it up for the year. Now let's head out of the garden and back to the shade garden with a stop along the way to check on our cuttings. I'm still busy taking cuttings in the garden and these are the cuttings we did about a month ago of coleus and some of the plectoranthus. And uh, this is uh, another succulent type plant. And also I did uh, pentas. I have white and red pentas and they also root quite easily. And I'm still taking cuttings. I have my uh, soil here. I have some rooting powder in my cup and I will cut from some of the herbs, uh, geraniums and the fragrant geraniums. And again, poke holes with my pencil, dip my cutting into the uh, rooting powder and I do cut right below where leaves have come out of the plant, pop them into the pot, and then I'll just leave them out here. And if it doesn't rain, I'm sure to water them. We don't need to keep them well watered. And these have all pretty much formed roots already. And I noticed a few were trying to bloom, and we want to limit that, so I'll cut off any bloom stalks that start forming. And before a frost, probably in a couple weeks, these will come inside and go under some plant lights for the rest of the winter. 
and at some point when I have the time I will take each of the three or four cuttings in each of these little pots and put them each in their own pot and grow them on for the rest of the winter. By the time spring comes I can put them into my planters. These were grown from cuttings last year and you'll see how they progress to form larger plants and fill up my planters at no cost to me other than watching the plants grow throughout the winter making sure they're watered and then in the spring adding a little fertilizer. Now let's head back to the pond and the shade garden. I don't have too much uh, blooming in my shade garden right now except my pots and planters that are filled with annuals but this is one that does bloom in the fall and it's called turtle head. It comes in uh, pink as a cultivar and the native one is white. I have a white one over on the other side but this is the pink one called hot lips and uh, if you look at them they look like little turtle heads and that's where it gets its common name and it's kind of a cute plant and it does add a little pop of color be it pink or white to the fall garden. I'd like to see this bunch grow out a little bit. I've got a lot of ground cover vinca around it. I need to pull some of that out and give it a little more space I think to have it really do a good job of filling this spot. Now going back to the pond. Fish are happy. They're looking for a handout here today. Maybe we'll give them one. Once the water cools to about 50 degrees, I'll switch to a, this is a summer blend fish food, but they do have one that's for cooler weather. It's easier to, for the fish to digest. So I'll switch to that once the water becomes colder. And when it becomes colder still, I will stop feeding the fish altogether. And they will spend the winter just fine in the pond as long as I keep a hole in the pond with the ice melter, which we'll put in later. You'll notice that the leaves are starting to fall uh, slowly, but uh, as they pick up speed, I will put this net over the pond to try to keep some of the leaves out of it. In order to do that, I do have to move my plants that are in the pond, all of the elephant ears that I have over on the other side of the pond, and my arrangement as well. They need to all be moved out of the pond and moved in for the winter. So I will gradually, over the next few weeks on these nice fall days, be moving the plants out of the pond and into my sunroom where they will spend the winter. Usually they just make it through the winter. Uh, they kind of die back. I have a few leaves, but not too many. And then they reach their prime out here in the summer when it's warm and they can get plenty of water on their roots. So the, the net will go on oh, probably before we meet again next month. It helps keeping some of the leaves out. I can use a net, but it would be a full-time job once these trees around me start losing their leaves. I have some fall grasses here. These I leave and these will turn a lovely brown color and uh, I will pick those and use them in fall arrangements inside. I have a fuchsia and a begonia. I have a couple begonias here. Those two will come in for the winter and be stored in a cool room and without uh, foliage, just the bulb that's underneath them. And hopefully then, in come spring, I can water them and they'll come back to life. This is the second year on both of these plants. And hopefully we can get a few more years out of them. The last of the hosta are now blooming. They'll soon be gone and cut back. Uh, these, this is a royal standard. It has kind of a purple and white bloom. And again, it's one of the last to bloom. Hostas bloom all the way from probably June to September. So depending on which varieties you get, they can really add to the garden. Now let's head on inside and prepare a fall meal using some of our produce from the garden and some we got at the farm stand. Uh, some grapevine. 
that I have plenty of grape vines. And this is one of the older grape vines. And I'm going to make a fall hanger. I tied a string on it for a hanger. Now, you might think that having a permanent type hanger would be good, but since I'm going to decorate the front of this, it is not going to be level necessarily. So you can use the string to level it up when you hang it on a wall. And that's what it's for, hanging on a wall. So I'm going to decorate it, and I can, I've decorated this for Christmas, for spring, and basically you can decorate it for all seasons. And what I'm going to do is add some little bunches of dried things, dried, this is a dried astilbe, and some uh, straw flowers and some safflowers that came in a floral arrangement that I got at one point. And I'm going to just kind of tie these on the corners of the uh, frame. I've made two little bunches. There's so many things you can use to decorate this. The idea is to get it fastened on there fairly tight. And for that, I'm, I'm just using the paddle wire that you can get at uh, Floral Supply or Michael's or any of the craft stores. So I've got uh, some of these down here. You can work them around where you want them. And then I'll do some uh, one in the upper corner as well. And again, I've tied them together. And I'll just fasten them to the frame. I can redo this then very easily for another season. This year, I think I'll try it for Valentine's Day. Think of something. But the dried things, there's a tansy and some yarrow and some pine cones in that spot. And, and then uh, I have a little cute little scarecrow that I'll put down on this one. And he's on a little hook. His head wants to wobble off, needs a little glue. But there, we have a quick fall wreath. To, I can hang that in my entryway. I wouldn't recommend putting it outdoors because uh, the dried things will, will not last outdoors. But it is something that you can hang in an entry or an enclosed, partially enclosed porch. So, or enclosed porch as a fall decoration. Again, many things. You can use Indian corn, uh, artificial leaves, or real ones. Real ones will curl. Uh, safflower, poppy pods, uh, perhaps an artificial apple. I grew these little Indian corns. They could be used as well. Just beware if you put these, uh, say, in an enclosed entry where something can get in that you will have only corn cobs left once the squirrels discover it. I made that mistake one year, putting out a large arrangement of Indian corn, only to find Indian corn cobs the next day, and very, very happy squirrels. The other thing I can do is string some of my peppers. I grow these little matchbox peppers. When they turn red, they're hot. They're hot when they're green. And what I'll do is just use a needle, and I use a what's called button twist, although you could use regular thread. And I'll start out by just pulling it through. I use a double strand, knotted, and then knot the bottom one, and then just continue stringing. I want to figure out how to make the round ones. I haven't figured that one out yet, but I do make strings. And here are some strings that I have done. And these can be hung as a fall decoration, and they can be used. The dried peppers can definitely be, be used. Add a lot of flavor to dried beans or other things that you might be cooking. So you have the dried peppers and a decoration. Something for every use. Now let's head to the kitchen and make a fall meal. I'm going to start out today by making a, a quick version of apple strudel. Now, the real apple strudel, you roll and roll and roll a thin dough. Uh, usually it's done on a sheet and on a large table until it's very, very thin. However, you can use either phyllo pastry that you buy 
or in this case, a puff pastry, which you can buy. And I have rolled out a puff pastry sheet to about 11 by 18 inches. And, I'm, and then as I, I cut slits in the side and left a spot in the center. This is not the real German apple strudel, but it certainly is a tasty replica of it. I have two cups of apples, which I have chopped, peeled and chopped, and uh, I've added a couple tablespoons of lemon juice to keep them from browning. And to that, we're going to add two tablespoons of sugar, just regular sugar, and a teaspoon of cinnamon, and a pinch of nutmeg, and about a third of a cup of white raisins, and some almonds. Again, a quarter of a cup of almonds, and I'll stir that together. And add some flour, about a tablespoon, half, half to a tablespoon of flour. This kind of will help thicken up this mixture as it bakes. And then I'm going to spoon the filling down the middle of my pastry. Uh, the authentic apple strudel is actually rolled many times and uh, butter is spread on the pastry as it's rolled. But this is, a, again, a quicker version for busier times. Kind of spread it out. And then I'm going to kind of fold up the ends a little bit. That last piece and the top end. Roll it around a little and make sure I've kind of evened out the filling. And then I will start kind of weaving these pieces over the top. And kind of pressing them down as I go. Every other one across. You get a kind of basket weave. Depending how thick you cut your little uh, slices off the sides. Depends how long it's going to take you to wrap it up. Every other one. And you want to cover most of the pastry. And we get to the end. I'm going to level it up a little bit. And then I'm going to uh, brush it with some beaten egg. I have some sparkling sugar that I'll sprinkle on it. I could also use damara sugar or raw sugar on top just to give it a little extra shine. You could also add some more of the almonds on top if you wished. And then we'll put that in the oven at 400 degrees for 25 to 30 minutes. And we'll have a quick apple strudel. Well, the next thing I'm going to make is a kale salad. And I've picked and washed my kale and uh, torn the center stalks out, uh, washed it, dried it, and we've torn the, the stalks out. And I'm going to start by the part that has to cook so that we'll have it ready. And then I'll make the dressing for it. I'm 
melting a uh, tablespoon of butter in my little frying pan here. And I'm going to add some ingredients to that. Once it's melted, this is one of our favorite fall salads. It's a warm kale and apple salad. And once the butter is pretty much melted, I'm going to add two tablespoons of brown sugar, a teaspoon of or so of minced garlic of minced ginger. And you can use fresh ginger, or in this case, I use candied ginger. We kind of like that. We're going to caramelize these apples a bit with the butter brown sugar mixture because the next thing I'll add is about a cup, cup and a half of sliced apples, peeled, cored, and sliced apples. And we're going to mix them around and let this mixture cook for a while. Move some of these things out. And I'm going to also add to that just a pinch of cayenne pepper, which is a hot pepper, and a tiny bit of nutmeg. Probably about an eighth of a teaspoon. And we'll stir this around and let them continue to cook until the apples soften. And while that's happening, we can make the dressing for the salad. And to do that, I've added two tablespoons of lemon juice. And we'll put in a quarter cup of olive oil. And a tablespoon of mustard. And this is the uh, brown, brown mustard. Grainy mustard, as it were. And I'm also going to add some, a teaspoon of grated lemon zest. and some salt, and some freshly ground pepper. This is not a tame salad. This is it's quite a, a flavorful salad that we're making. And I'm going to shake this together. Until everything has combined. I'm going to turn this up a little bit. Once I've combined all the dressing ingredients, I'll add them to the kale. And then I want to actually massage them into the kale. And the best way to do it is just with your hands. And you want to squeeze the dressing right into the kale. Kale is a very substantial green. And uh, this works its way in and kind of softens it up. And, and this will last quite a while at this point. And then, of course, I need to wash. And our 
apples are starting to bubble. And it will take a few minutes. Okay, most of my liquid is now uh, evaporated and I'm car the apples have, are nice and done and caramelized. And I can add those to my kale, warm. This is a warm salad, or would be served warm. But it's also good cold or at room temperature. And to that, I'm going to add a couple more ingredients, some toasted walnuts, and either feta or blue cheese, about a quarter of a cup of each. This is mixed together with the mustardy kale, and this is our salad that will go with the next dish I'm going to prepare. And I'll put that over to the side a little bit. And bring my frying pan back over. And melt some more butter. And I'm going to make stuffed pork chops. These will go in the oven. I'm not going to be cooking them right now. But I have uh, butterflied two boneless pork chops. They were fairly thick. And I just butterflied them so that I have a nice pocket. And I'm going to make a filling to go in the middle. And this is a, an old recipe. I have made these many, many times. And I'm going to be adding to my butter as it melts a quarter of a cup of celery from my garden and about two tablespoons of onion, both chopped. I did grow celery this year and uh, we're using it. Uh, it will go with the first frost, so we want to make sure we do use it. And I'm going to let these saute a little bit. just until the uh, onion and celery get somewhat soft. And now I'm going to add a quarter cup of frozen corn and let them continue to saute. It's okay if they even brown just a little bit. We're starting to uh, get the aroma of the onions and celery and corn, which means it's about ready to finish adding some other ingredients. So I, I will turn it off but leave it on the stove and I'll add a cup of breadcrumbs. And these crumbs are, are dried crumbs, so I may have to add some more liquid. And I'm adding sage, and this is fresh sage. So uh, I'll add about a teaspoon and a half. Normally, if it's dried sage, you would add half a teaspoon, but you want to go three times the amount of uh, dried if you're using the fresh herbs. And let me get a spoon and stir this together. And yes, we will need to add some liquid. And I'll start out by adding some egg, about a small egg's worth. And then probably a little water. If you use uh, bread that you have crumbed, fresh bread, you will not need to add extra water. There will be enough with the moisture in the bread. And the next thing I want to do is stuff the pork chops. And we'll just pat this mixture into each chop. 
it gets a little messy. And if some spills out, that's fine too. We want to put quite a bit in each one. And pack it down a little. If I have it extra, I can just leave it in, put it in the pan around the pork chops themselves. And we'll close up the pork chops over the stuffing. And get some more in this one. And then I'll put, just put the rest around the chops and it will cook and the uh, juices from the pork chops will moisten it. So these are ready to go in the oven and they will go in the oven at 325 degrees covered with foil and you want to cover them with foil for about 45 minutes after which you take off the foil and cook them for a further 30 minutes. That ensures that the pork is completely done and the stuffing will be cooked. By putting the foil on the top you keep the moisture in and the stuffing will then brown later when you take the uh, cover off. Time to take our strudel out of the oven and bring it over and uh, set it down on the table. I'll put it on a tray later, but right now it's pretty hot. So here's our fall meal. We have an apple strudel, a kale and apple salad. We're making some good use of the fall apples and corn stuffed pork chops that will go in the oven uh, with foil on top of them for 45 minutes and then without foil for about 20 minutes. The strudel that we made, or mock strudel, used puff pastry instead of the rig strudel roll, which is often stretched very thin. This is much easier and you can serve that slightly warm with a nice scoop of vanilla ice cream for dessert and you have a nice fall meal for September. I'm Liz Davey, and you've been watching A Walk in the Garden on NCTV, Norfolk Community Cable.